said, when I tell you how to put my best outfit on, oh my God, I will walk through the courthouse, girl. I don't give a hell if it was 90 degree weather in my best furs and diamonds and pearls and jewels. I'm here to divorce Smokey D. Robinson. My name is Claudette Robinson. I'm going to keep the last name. <laughs> Now Claudette lost her control. She cried, she screamed, she shook with anger. She told me that was it, it was all over. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. No, it wasn't. Don't like how when you hear them talk about this situation in the media, they make it seem like Claudette left Smokey. Smokey, you know, still being a gentleman, old Claudette couldn't tolerate me having a baby. But hold tight. I said I understood. I had no explanations. It happened. I was responsible. The child was mine. I decided to move out. To be with Candy? Claudette wanted to know? No, to be with myself. To figure out what I want to do. I don't expect you to wait for me. If you want to file for a divorce, I'll understand. I can't say anything except that I'm sorry. I left, found an apartment, got higher and higher, fell lower and lower. Meanwhile, my recording career was going down the toilet. I hadn't had a hit since being with you, and that was four years ago. So I wanna take a quick moment to reflect back on books we've read prior, okay? Now, I remember specifically reading, not sure which book this was, but I want to think it was Sugar Ray's book. That's Raynoma Gordy Singleton, Barry Gordy's second wife book, or it was Call Her Miss Ross. I'm not sure, or Mary Wilson's book. When Smokey speaks of how he hadn't had a hit in a while, this is when I remember in reading in one of those books that Barry Gordy had Smokey Robinson's back. He hadn't had a hit. He wasn't bringing no money into Motown, but Barry Gordy showed up at his house to one of his birthday parties with a very expensive watch. And that's all Smokey Robinson thought he was getting out of the deal. Then he handed Smokey Robinson some keys. Smokey Robinson went outside and saw, uh, uh, I don't know if it was brand new. It could have been pre-used pre or, or newsed, whatever it is you want to call it. But Barry Gordy had gifted him for his birthday that expensive watch and a new Rolls Royce. I was too effed up to run, too fried to play golf, too frazzled to do concerts. Barry Gordy grew alarmed. Come up to my place, man. I need to talk to you. He kept me up at his Bel Air mansion for a week, trying to talk some sense into me. I'm not into the drug thing that much, man. I lied. Bullshit. I can stop when I want to. More bullshit. All the time I was there, I was thinking about getting high, thinking I was fooling Barry, thinking I was fooling everyone. I never had any dope with me, though out of respect for Barry and his position. What's more, he maintains a strict no drug policy, which I wasn't about to defy. Stay as long as you want smoke, he urged, but just promise me you'll stop. I promised him, I lied. In his guest house, when I slept, he put magazine articles and brochures outlining the dangers of boogity sugary. I didn't care. Daddy was dead, Trey was alive, Claudette was hurt, Candy was worried. Candy begged me to tell her what was happening. She knew something was wrong, but I wouldn't say a word. The kids were missing me, I was missing myself, running from myself, smoking this shiz till it made me so sick I needed more. After six months, I told Claudette to go ahead and divorce me. I had mad respect for Claudette because my thing is when you say something and you put 10 toes planted on it, 
then you mean it. No matter how bad it hurts you. Look, you get another bitch pregnant. I'm out. When I read this part, I told Claudette to go ahead and divorce me. I was like, come on, Miss Claudette. Come on, come on. I know you ain't that damn pressed. Now, it would be one thing if Claudette did not say that. If she did not say, well, if you get another woman pregnant, then I'm going to leave you. Okay? If she never said that, then I would expect for her to react the way that she reacted or do things the way that she did them. But this is what you said, Miss Claudette. And I know you love the man, but God damn it. If you don't stand for something, then you'll fall for everything. And the everything includes that baby that you said that you would not stand for. Does that mean it's all over, she asked? I guess so. Well, I won't do it, Smokey. I won't divorce you, despite everything. It's not a divorce I want. You're going to have to initiate the procedure I won't. Man, right after that ninja told me, when I tell you how to put my best outfit on, oh my God, I will walk through the courthouse, girl. I don't give a hell if it was 90 degree weather in my best furs and diamonds and pearls and jewels. I'm here to divorce Smokey the Robinson. My name is Claudette Robinson. I'm going to keep the last name, okay, because I like the, the accommodations that come with it. But I'm finna divorce this nigga. Where's my lawyer? Two days later, in a fatigued, fogged, overstate of mine, I went to see a lawyer. So Smokey the Robinson got to cheat on you, fall in love with two other women, move out to be or to have accessibility to the other women have a baby on you, and he gets to divorce you? Come on, Claudette. Ooh, Claudette girl, ooh, you fang you. What are your grounds for divorce, he asked. None, I said, my wife's a wonderful woman. I love her, I'm just not in love with her anymore. It happens. He said something about irreconcilable differences. I nodded, she got the papers. She grew angry and bitter. <laughs> What's wrong, Puda? One day I went to see the kids and bumped into Claudette. When I tried to act civil, she was short and hostile with me. Why can't we still be friends, I asked. Friendship and divorce don't coincide. She answered, statistics prove that. Don't talk to me about statistics, I said. This is you and me. We cared about each other for 30 years. That doesn't have to change. I care about you and I hope you'll care about me for the rest of our lives. I'd reached her for a moment. She grew warmer, came off her attitude ask, ask. after my health. I was defensive, said I was fine, said nothing was wrong, but Claudette knew me. She knew I was lying. What about you, baby? I asked. She put on weight and I worried about her high blood pressure. She too was defensive. We were both hurting so bad until our hearts practically burst from pain. Yeah, because he don't know what to do. He ain't just losing his wife. He's losing one of his best friends. The wife has been with him forever. So I understand the hurt and the pain. Claudette, you ain't the only one that's hurting. But Miss Claudette hurt them motherfucking pockets. You're gonna divorce me or nigga, you going to pay. Pay, 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 piggity pay. Hey. This was the woman I'd loved all my life, but a woman I knew I'd never live with again. The thought of that, the guilt behind it, had me up night after night. Those little cocaine cigarettes drove away the pain. Get me more, I told my man. I want more. I want you to come to my baptism, Claudette said. You said we were friends. Well, it's important to me that you're there. I'll be there, I promised. Claudette had rediscovered religion. She'd renewed her relationship with God. I was happy, but I was also high, even at the church. In a suit and tie, I sat there next to Tamla and Barry. By now, they were beautiful teenagers. I felt anything but beautiful. I watched Claudette being submerged in holy water. I left the church filled with some spirit I couldn't contain. So I got high. 
I stayed high. People are after me. People are following me, I told my friend Forrest Harrison, who'd always been there for me in times of trouble. You're sick, baby brother, he said. You're hallucinating. You need help. Let me help you. I wouldn't let anyone near me. Relatives and close friends started weeping for me. Promoters wondered why I wasn't working. So I booked a concert date. Even at my lowest ebb, my fans never knew about my condition. Never deserted me. I could always draw a crowd. Before I went on though, I got extremely effed up. Went out and faced the audience. I sang, but with none of the old fire. Instead, I saw ghosts. Jackie Wilson collapsing on stage. Sam Cooke being shot through the heart. What if my heart gave out? She's dead, I heard imaginary voices say as I walked back to my dressing room. Gwen Gordy gave a birthday party for her brother, Fuller. Marvin was back from Europe on the heels of sexual healing. He was triumphant. Told you I had a plan, man, he said, hugging me as though he'd never been mad at me. I'm happy for you, Dad. This is the best comeback I've ever seen. You ain't pissed I left Motown? I'm just glad you're working again, man. Everyone's glad for you. He was high that night, and I could feel the drugs manipulating his moods. I knew he still wasn't right. Months passed. He went on tour, and there was talk that the tour was bedlam. Talk that Marvin was so coked out he was dropping his pants during the shows. Talk he was acting crazy and falling deep into despair. I tried contacting him, but never got through. Then on April Fool's Day, 1984, the news came in. It was a cold shock, a kick in the groin. I heard it on the radio. Dad was dead, killed by his father. Now I was moving in the same direction. You say that you love me. 